gracious thing to the Cap Gemini folks for making this happen. Um, part of what we've been able to do um, in this series has, uh, we've had a bunch of different kinds of things we've done. One of which has been, we've had a little theme here of the uh, launching some very important, interesting books. Um, we had Facebook co-founder Chris Hughes, uh, one of the first events he ever did, uh, was uh, here on his book, his new book, Fair Shot. We also did Neil Gershenfeld and his two brothers who did their latest, he did his latest book. He's the founder of the, really one of the fathers of the uh, maker movement and the Fab Lab uh, movement. We actually did their early book. And today we've got another one in that line uh, with David doing Duncan uh, and his new book here, Talking to Robots, Tales from Our Human Robot Future. Um, so we're in that space. Now, I would say what's interesting about this, uh, there's many things interesting about this book. We are going to talk about the book. Um, the book is essentially takes these a wide variety of potential futures uh, from many different fields of perspectives that goes out and explains the implications of AI and advanced robotics in these different fields. And he does it in a very entertaining, kind of fictionalized way. We'll get into that a little bit here. So we are going to talk about the actual book on one level. But because we have the longer format here, and because we're actually opening it up to video and other different uh, audiences from here and also to watch it later, which, by the way, if you want to help us out on that, we've got the live stream here and the hashtag there if you want to do that, um, where the live stream is. But anyhow, since we're opening this up to wider audiences, and since we can go deep, we're going to do a bunch of things tonight. One of the other things we're going to do is he, think of it this way, he went and talked to 30 bona fide experts, not just in AI and all, but in these, all these fields who are at least aware of where AI and robotics was and how it could impact their fields. And he essentially interviewed them to kind of help him understand how he could tell these futures. But because of that, we'll be able to dial it back and also talk about, hey, what's really happening in these fields right now in the near term, what's happening now, what's happening in the next five years, and also kind of really down to earth concrete business implications for those that want to kind of more visceral kind of near term kind of look here. And the third thing about David is David is a bona fide expert himself, I would say, uh, in the life sciences. Honestly, for the last 20 years, he is really one of the premier science writers in the whole space of life sciences, genetics, uh, biotech. In fact, he is my go-to guy when I want to know something that's about or actually understand who the heck is doing what and what's really smart to follow. And it's really David I check into. And so even though this book is on AI and robotics, we'll actually be able to kind of bring into the story of this interview other amazing things going on in genetics and hearing all kinds of things that will be paralyzed Par par parallel kind of tracks, essentially, alongside this AI and robotics revolution. So it's going to be a very complex and interesting conversation. And so the way we're going to start this, which is we're going to, David's going to come up here, and he's going to give a little presentation, which is going to base talk a little bit about the book, but he's also going to ask, there's a few questions in there that he's been asking folks that you folks might be able to interact with a little bit. I'll then come up with a little interview, as usual, and kind of get into some of these deeper spaces. And then we'll roll into a conversation with all of you, which is always some of the most fun part of the night. And with that, let's give a big what's now welcome to David. All right, I'm so happy to be here. And uh, for any of you that have, have had anything to do with uh, writing a book or a big project, you, know, you work on something for a couple of years, and it's really in your head, and then suddenly it launches. I would like to talk to you tonight about almost, I call it kind of technophrenia, a little bit schizophrenia, about how we love and fear technology, and especially robots and AI that can really apply to any technology, pretty much in any period of history as well. We seem to be particularly technophrenic, if you will, right now, about how much we love, or, or we did anyway, love our phones, or we love the latest technology, and they're coming in very fast <coughs> Almost by day, we love them, especially you know, entrepreneur and investor or something like that. You're, you're all day pitching your new technology and how amazing it is. But there's also this fear aspect. And uh, um, so you go home at night, I mean, after you've been pitching your company all day, and you watch Netflix and all these dystopic 
shows and films and all of this, right? And so, you know, what's going on there? And so I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that. And the book is about 24 different kinds of robots, and I'll get to a couple of them here. But I wanted to frame it in this kind of big meta message about where we are. And as Pete said, I have a great privilege of being able to write about uh, some of these new technologies and interact with some of the great figures and, and inventors and scientists and entrepreneurs who are actually developing these, mostly in life sciences. But in this book, I, I got to branch out a little bit. Um, but I posed actually this question to them, among many others. So but th I think that's a pervasive moment here in our current history. So I would like to suggest, I think maybe we close, that along this idea of this sort of love here, that we in fact develop some sort of technology around us so we can actually understand why do we love, why do we fear, how much do we love, how much do we fear. So just, it's a little bit tongue in cheek here, but maybe an app would be a kind of robo love fear meter. And let me explain what this might be. So it actually would be a meter and it measure how much we love, which would be a plus, plus one, plus five, whatever the scale would be, and fear, um, minus one to minus five. Um, and zero being neutral. So I'll pop to the plus five first, because that's what we're all hoping for, right? So robo-utopia. in their really nascent, earliest phases. But I'll jump back to plus one. I don't know, let's do Siri at plus one, maybe, okay? But I would also go Siri at minus one. <laughs> As we know, I mean, these, these, uh, you know, these kind of technologies that, that use voice recognition, they're pretty good for certain things, but they're not so good for other things. And uh, that could be across the board of all of them. And in fact, many of these technologies have both a plus and a minus. And I, I won't go over the rest of it here, but uh, these are just some examples. Driverless car gets a plus two and a minus two, you know, because there's some real advantages to it. There are also some issues with it. And one of my favorite, the plus three Star Trek computer versus Hell 9000. <laughs> so that's kind of a little tongue in cheek again, but it's serious in the sense that I think, especially the people that make these machines, don't they don't think enough, and maybe it's not even entirely their job, but they should think to some extent about why they go home and watch dystopic, you know, sci-fi at night while they're making utopic, or at least they hope utopic, technology during the day. And we've never been very good as a species in considering the fear aspect or what might go wrong uh, before things go wrong. But as these waves of technology are hitting us faster and faster, uh, I would pose that we need to get a lot better at that. And as I said, I'm going to go through some of the robots in the book for, in this love-fear context. But I did want to place us in time here. And this is not a surprise to people in the field, but uh, in the book I made up this term, early robot era, ERE, and in the future, where you know, the book is actually told in the future. So they're looking back at our time, and we call it the early ro robot era. And that's somewhere way down in the beginning. And this is just one way we could evolve. There's lots of other ways. This is kind of a utopic evolution where we end up you know, being one with the machine and to go very differently as well. But the point here is that we're at the very beginning, and I'll circle back to that at the end. I also want to point out that this is actually a robot today. And most robots are robotic arms, you know, they're, they're, me they're mechanical uh, bots that do mostly one thing. They might, you know, weld, put a weld on a car door, or in, in the stuff I do in, in bio lab, they, they move around samples and they, they analyze samples. Um, this is another aspect of robots today. This is Siri, and we put the in, again, the other voice recognition. But this is kind of where we are, okay? And where we're not, unfortunately, but hopefully we will be, or maybe we will be. Although, I don't know, the enigmatic ending of this movie, who knows? Um, but we are not there. And I want to make that clear. Now, in the future, you have to kind of read the book. Do we, do we get there or not? We're also not here, and I'm a historian by training, um, studying history and technology, 
And it's so fascinating to go back in time on how different eras viewed the future. So this was a 60s, early 60s view of the Jetsons, where you know, Rosie the Robot would welcome George with a cocktail. Uh, and, and that was supposed to happen, by the way, a long time before the time we're living in right now. Nothing happened yet. Um, but that's not what we're talking about either. Um, and then, of course, I have to throw this up here. This is the you know, Terminator apocalyptic view. I actually don't think this will happen, but certainly in the way where these machines you know, turn malevolent, I think they'll just either just wipe us out for, for no particular reason. I mean, they're not going to have us still around if they, if they decide to go rogue like this. Or, I think, much more likely, they're just going to ignore us. And like the movie Her, I mean, it's, yeah, okay. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so, I think it's much more likely that that will happen. They'll just, you know, I mean, as their brains get bigger and bigger, they'll just, you know, will be sort of annoying insects buzzing in your ears. So that's what it's not. So I'm going to go through a few robots here, and so just to expand a little bit on on the basic structure of the book and how I've been thinking about this. Um, each of the 24 robots in the book is reported from the present. So I'm a, I'm a nonfiction journalist, and so fiction is somewhat new to me, but so I, I sort of cheated, I did both. Um, so politician bot, for instance, I talk about what's really happening with AI in governments right now. And I talk to real people and real politicians. And, but that's kind of, there's a story wrapped around that that's fictional. And as I said, it's all told from the future by a narrator that it's not identified. Um, some people think it might be me. Maybe reveal that someday, uh, if that's true or not. But, um, so, politician bot in the love and fear context, we would love, wouldn't we love right now to have an AI system or a robot politician that didn't lie, didn't have the ego, that you know, knew all the data, and could kind of just do the right thing? Wouldn't that be great? We would love that. And it's, it's you know, very alluring to think about that. The fear, of course, is Big Brother, which fact is beginning to play out in some culture or some countries around the world where AI is being aggressively used to uh, you know, do what happened in 1984 in George Orwell's book, but it might be more like 2024 or 2034. Uh, it's got a year long. So anyway, we hope to avoid this. We would love to have more of something like that. And as I said, um, I've been reporting this in the present. It's fascinating to really go through and spend time researching this, looking into it. Um, but if you can believe it, 25% of Europeans in the recent poll want to have AI controlling their governments. And Germany was the highest at 43%. So go um, figure. And of course, you have people saying, you know, I don't know if it's, it, it's somewhat hopeful, somewhat you know, scary to people writing about this but maybe AI will be the end of government as we know it. And there was an interesting moment uh, when uh, President Macron in France held an AI summit last year, and he called AI not a technological revolution or as much a technological revolution as a political revolution. And what he meant by that is our basic government structures in the West were formed 18, you know, in the 18th century, and it's, it's questionable whether a democracy could keep up with the pace of change and right now. We all know it's a very sloppy form of government. It's liberty that takes a long time. And when decisions need to be made quickly, you know, in a, in a sort of AI-fueled technology, uh, can that even survive? So, time to automate politicians. There's a lot out there right now about this. This is one of my favorites, though, because Sam in New Zealand is actually going to run for high office in New Zealand in 2020. And there were a couple of robots that actually ran for office in, 20, in the last say, two to four years, um, including um, for the mayor of Tokyo. Um, that robot lost, but um, we can expect that to continue. Um, now, Pete mentioned we're going to have some questions for you all. So I hope you're ready. I've been talking at you for a few minutes here. Um, so we've been running a survey, which I hope we can get, I don't know, how you all signed up, but if we can get you the survey, um, the publisher and I are you know, hoping we get at least several hundred people taking this. 
Um, it's, it's kind of fun, but it, it opens up some of the questions posed by the book and by this issue. Um, would, it, would an advanced AI system be better than a human serving as President of the United States? So how many would say yes? We don't have one serving now. So. <laughs> well, it's funny you say that, because in the book, there is a certain president who is a robot, but I'll just leave it at that. Um, anybody, yes? A robot rather than a human? Okay. A few people. Okay, I guess everybody else is no, right? But put your hands up. you got to be on the record here. No. Would you know? No. Yes. It's, it's rather than a human. All right. So, uh, that's pretty much the way the survey is so far. We've had about 50 or 60 people take this so far. Um, and like I said, we're going to be playing this out, but I, I thought I'd put up at least preliminary results. But that's pretty close to what, what we just voted on. Okay, how about a doc bot? And this is more in my field. So AI and health and, and health data is more my field. Um, but what we would love is to have a robot that's not only up on all the latest diagnoses and diseases and you know how to treat you, but also um, is empathetic and all the things that you know when you really need a, a human to, to touch you or hold your hand or tell you it's all right. Um, I think it's hard for us to imagine a robot doing that. But you know, if if we were going to go this route, that's that's what we would want. We want the whole package. Um, and I have a lot to say about that in the book, by the way. Um, the fear is that she'll have just some, you know, basically video screen on, on a stick, which in fact exists right now, but it does exist. Um, and please turn around and bend over, you have 12 seconds to comply. Um, so it all becomes very, very regimented. And the odd thing is that with humans running the system right now, you get some of this too. So, you know, the question is whether robots will do a better or worse job than we're doing right now. Um, again, this is a big topic. It's been out in the news a lot. Um, you know, speculating on uh, when when AI or robots might take over, or beginning to take over. And this is a fun one. This article, although it was in a fairly obscure um, publication, uh, 15 medical robots are changing the world. And I've gotten to see a lot of these, and some of them are really amazingly impressive. Like some of the surgical robots. <coughs> They're much more precise where they need to be than a human who's, you know, even if they're really steady, they're still going to maybe shake a little bit. A robot will not do that. Um, and then on and on um, about, you know, how AI should promise. And I know a lot more about this field. We can talk about it later. But um, so far, the AI experiment has been marginally successful, I would say. It's still a pretty old-fashioned industry, and it probably should be. I mean, this should be one of the last because it is our lives at stake and the lives of our loved ones. So, would you be okay if a robot replaced your human doctor? Yes? A few more? You might have something to say about your doctor. Uh, okay, and then the nose. Okay. How many people didn't vote, by the way? A few? Oh, that's fair, though. Yeah, well, you, right, you would want Dr. McCoy and whatever machines he has, right? That's kind of the perfect combination. Um, so, you know, again, I think we're pretty close uh, here in the room to uh, what's been in the survey so far. Um, there's some fun chapters in the book, just some really short ones. Um, this, this, one of them is called Coffee Delivery Bot, and it's just, it's a story of a, of a woman in the future who's, you know, waking up in the morning and she summons a bot, and it's a lot like Uber. So you, know, you summon it, it comes in a drone, and you're getting you know, reports on how many minutes away it is. And so we would love to have that, right? Wouldn't you love if you didn't go to get it back? You just summon it, and in this case, it's Coffee Bot Fred. He's only three minutes away. And suddenly, the Coffee Bot Fred is stuck in a, in a drone jam, and he's 17 minutes away. Oh my God. And by the way, we've forgotten in the future how to make our own coffee. So wait for Coffee Bot Fred. And then we love it because Coffee Fred has arrived unexpectedly early, not 17 minutes. And so the problem here is, though, that you were so stressed out while you were waiting for Coffee Bot Fred that you started, all your biometrics started registering stress and anxiety. So when you got there, Coffee Bot Fred uses his biometrics. And by the way, this is a real device. This is 
strong and with biometrics. And it tells you, I'm sorry, you're too stressed, you can't have any more caffeine. So anyway, those, those are some examples of robots. And I wanted to throw up here where the publisher, uh, which is Dutton, it's part of Penguin, uh, has been kind enough to uh, hire an illustrator. And we're working on some pretty cool images of some of the different bots in the book. And by the way, it's somewhat whimsical. Finally fell off. OK. Uh, the book is somewhat whimsical, just so you know. And so we try to capture that in, in some of these drawings. But we talked about politician about a minute ago. Um, you know, this, this is a cartoon we've come up with. I cannot tell why I have nobody go, what could possibly go wrong? And then uh, there's, a, of course, a sex bot in the book. And by the way, there's a warrior bot, a journalism bot, a thriller writer bot. Um, you know, it goes on and on. And um, towards the end, we have immortal Mebot. We have a synthetic Mebot, which is, you know, robots are not all going to be mechanical. Some of them are going to be synthetic or biological. So this is sex and intimacy bot. Robot love is complicated. This was a difficult one because I didn't do the illustrations. Um, and I, they were sent to me to come up with captions. So I hope you like that caption. Um, so Godbot is one of the last chapters. And there are humans, as I call them, human collaborators in each of the chapters. And this was Brian Greene. So I went to people like Brian Greene, the physicist, uh, Kevin Kelly, um, a number of other really interesting, David Baldacci, the thriller bot. Um, and I asked these humans, what robot would you like to meet in the future or be afraid of meeting and why? And some of them I kind of shaped, like I was hoping David would talk about a thriller robot, which he did. Some of them, though, went completely crazy on me. Like Kevin Kelly did Teddy Bear Bot. And I don't know if you know Kevin, but he's a great futurist writer. Um, and Teddy Bear Bot basically raises our children in the future. But the question around that one is, who programs Teddy Bot? Is it the company that built it? Is it you? Is it you know some political party? So anyway, uh, Brian Green came up with this robot that he wanted. He was desperate for actually. As a theoretical physicist, he's trying to figure out the secrets of the universe, the beginning, how it began, how it end, will end, and everything in between. And so as we're talking, and he's getting more and more excited about it, this robot will be able to tell him all these secrets. We kind of both decided this was sort of like a god bot. And this is not the religious god, but you know, godlike in the sense that it would actually know pretty much all the secrets of the universe. So ask me anything, really, I know everything. There is to know about the universe. Um, and I love this artist rendition. That one's a little spooky. This god bot, I think, would probably not look like that. But anyway, that's her, her interpretation of it. Um, and by the way, having a god bot that knows everything about the universe allows the, and you know, Brian, Brian suggested this, that if we knew all of that, the whole idea of time being linear would probably disappear. So we'd be able to know where, you know, or at least have some knowledge, uh, if not exist, in all times at once. And so in that future, which is kind of a cool future, we come up with timeliners. They're like starships, but they, get, they travel through time and space. And so, I got to have some fun with that, and you know, Brian, again, helped me come up with some of that. So just a couple more questions, and then we'll get to our chat. Um, and can robots and AI be trusted to make ethical and moral decisions? So what do you think, yes or no? Yes? Yeah. Can they be trusted? Yeah. I know. By the way, these are intentionally just straight ahead questions. They're not giving you any caveats. So you, you have to sort of imagine, you know, if you believe that AI can be trusted, you have to imagine that we've had the technology to do that, because we don't really right now. But you know, someday maybe. So you can you can you're free to imagine or not imagine. If you can't imagine that or you can't believe it, then you would vote no. So anybody yes? Interesting. Okay. Um, no. How about the no's? Okay. Any non votes? Abstentions? Okay. So uh, again, pretty, pretty close. I'd say this is a little more on the no side, maybe in the room here. But, um, I find this absolutely fascinating because right now they can't be trusted. There's no way. <laughs> I mean, they just, they're designed that way. I mean, in some cases, we're designing into them uh, some specific ethical or moral, um, you know, uh, functions around whatever they're doing. 
doing, um, you know, for instance, automated warfare, and there, there's a chapter in the book called WarriorBot, um, cannot take lethal action without consulting a human first, or at least that's what they tell us. Um, so that's, I, you know, I guess some sort of moral or ethical programming. Um, of course, you're leaving it up to a human at that point, so you trust the human. Um, one more question. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future of humans in the coming age of robots? So how many people are optimistic? Okay, it's about half. How many are pessimistic? There's another, actually, third answer here, which just depends on the day. <laughs> you can vote again if you want. How many people are there? Depends on the day. Depends on the day, whether, whether you're optimistic or pessimistic. Okay. So that's, that's how this came out. Um, not many. I mean, by the way, almost everybody that was asked this, uh, they're, they're most, most of them are technology people, and they tend to be fairly optimistic about technology. So as we spread this out and, and talk to a lot of different people, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, so finally, one of the things, you know, as a writer um, and a historian that fascinates me is how we humans are trying to build machines to do things that we don't understand about ourselves. Like, if you think about you know, a sex or a relationship bot, or, or even a warrior bot, or any, pretty much any of these robots, um, when you start getting into human emotion, uh, we're still trying to figure out relationships ourselves. We probably always will be. You know, can we actually program that in, into a robot or a computer or AI system? There are people trying to do that. So it's fascinating. So robots, not even getting humans. And then finally, um, going back to the early robot era that we're living in, the ERA, um, we are right now on the cusp of having a lot of these very powerful robots. In some cases, they're really you know, here, in, in, at least in the beginning stages. And it's a scary thing for us in this generation we're living in, or the, you know, the next maybe generation or two after us. We are building the base code. We're writing the base code. We're, we're, we're basically setting the foundations for this coming age of robots and AI. And we have a gigantic responsibility to make sure to um, future generations that we do this right. And I'll leave it to you whether you think we're doing a good job on that. So love and fear, and that's the book. Um, it's here tonight. It's also out in Britain with a slightly different title, much different cover. And I want to thank you.
these are things that are really about what it is to be human, to what extent we enhance ourselves, to what extent we to augment ourselves, where you draw the line. So I don't know. What, do you, yeah. do you want to talk a little bit about some of those other questions you're pushing? There? No, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's really it's partly how far would you go if these technologies existed, but. Um, you know, synthetic biology, again, in the early phases right now, but it's conceivable that we've already got some gene editing in some clinical trials right now. Um, I wrote a piece last year for Wired on the first human genome that's going to be completely synthetically made. In other words, every letter in the DNA is going to be constructed in a lab, which has never been done before. And you can rewrite the code, you know, the entire code. It's not just edits. And as we move on in time, uh, we're all going to have choices like that. And the questions in the survey were, were how far would you go? But it's so interesting because, um, you know, if everybody's doing it, you know, are you going to do it? And there's a chapter in the book called, called Homo Syntheticus, or sorry, Homo Digitalis and Homo Syntheticus. And in the future, in this fictional story there, there's a big day, and it's called a choice. And each of us has to choose if we're going to go digital, in other words, we're going to download ourselves, digitize our thoughts and everything in our brain and the essence of who we are, you know, into a computer or a robot, or we're going to go synthetic. And this is because the, the galactic government has decided everyone should get this because only the rich got it before. So there's been this huge push to give everybody this, but it's mandated you have to decide. And you can opt out, but that's, you get penalties. That's, in a sense, almost like a survey. But it's like trying to make people think about what, how they would choose. And humanity ends up going about 50-50 with this. But um, there are a lot of people that think that both of these technologies will exist. So partly it's the biosynthetic where you stay human. And by the way, the two humans in that are, are um, Juan Enriquez, who you might know, especially from TED Talks. But he is desperate to digitize his, himself because he wants to go to the stars. And right now, with radiation in space and some other problems, uh, biological material is not going to survive to go much beyond. Probably even even Mars is going to be a challenge. It's one of the biggest challenges of going into space. So he would love this technology. Uh, he's an investor, and he's investing heavily in this. Uh, the other human is George Church, who uh, some of you may know, um, you know, one of the top geneticists probably in the world. Um, and he's the guy whose lab uh, I wrote about last year with Wired building a synthetic human genome. Uh, so these technologies are in the very early stages, but uh, the question is, you know, how far would you go? Especially if it was safe. Well, one of the things about the book, which I um, encourage you all to read, um, but he, and he caught in his discussion here, or his, his little intro, is it, it gets way out there. And at some point you sit there and go, oh, this is just too weird. It's like, never good. You know, we're not going to have Poly AI politicians necessarily are not going to have, you know, download our brains. On the other hand, um, it really does, uh, the extreme storytelling makes you think about it in a different way. And then almost all the stories, just to make clear here, kind of get dialed back also. And there's a kind of a sense of, by thinking extreme in all these directions, extreme positive and extreme negative, it kind of makes you kind of realize that the early questions we're dealing with here do have big implications. I mean, is that kind of why you, you did the extreme? Because it was like, someone more way out there. Yeah, I mean, the thought experiments, and you know, they're, they're probably far, I mean, we aren't gonna have a choice where everybody has to, or maybe we will, but I, I doubt it. But the, 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 the idea there is to just make you think if you did have a choice like that. But I would argue that if you were, you know, transported here from 100 years ago and saw some of the things that we're having, you know, that, that we're dealing with now, like climate change, you would have guessed that human activity, and I hope you all agree with human activity, um, would have caused this, you know, this incredible crisis that we have right now. I mean, that's pretty far out there. I mean, nobody was thinking about anything remotely like that, probably even 50 years ago. Yeah. And, I mean, you know, uh, you know, again, studying the history of this is so fascinating because people freaked out getting on a train that went 20 miles an hour in the 1820s. I mean, that to them was like just so far out. If you had told them yeah. 50 years earlier that they were going to be on something that went 20 miles an hour, they would never have believed it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it, I do get a little extreme, but I'm not sure that I can, I mean, I'm even extreme enough given some of the crazy stuff we're already doing. 
Totally. Now, um, we're going to have some questions a little bit here, though. Do hold questions here. Um, but let's talk about a few other things here. Um, again, think about this way. Every one of these stories, too, has a kind of a real world, very concrete thing we got to think about right now. And you have to kind of read between the lines to get them, for example. So, for example, you mentioned this teddy bear box. And you think, Okay, a kid would have a little teddy bear bot, and the bot would be a security thing because you could, you know, if something happened, the parents could figure out what, or would be alerted on it. It would be able to teach basic stuff. I mean, a human couldn't just be immersed all the time. It would make the kid, you know, you can react to the kid. But then you really start thinking through the implications of that. And I think you touched on this programming thing, but it's like, you know, how many different parenting styles are different nuances of like when you want to teach them what and where do you draw the line and is it a religious one or is it a you know the kind of organic kind of brain the worldview it how do you adjust that and it kind of makes you get right into the fabric of what we're dealing with right now in all these early systems which is they are getting programmed we are making very core structural choices around these things and they're going to potentially have long-term implications. I don't know. Do you want to talk a little bit about how, how that programming thing is where it happens? Well, part of what this is about, and the thing that fascinates me is, is something I mentioned, um, which is we don't understand a lot of how we work as humans. And you know, we all have different ways we think about raising our children. And it, it's, it's very complicated why we, we do it. Some people are more strict. Uh, some people are, are lenient. Um, some people are religious, some are not. I mean, it goes on and on and on. We haven't had to think, I mean, it's complicated enough, but we haven't had to think beyond our own beliefs about our, our own children and how our society weighs in. And um, To actually program this into a, machine, a very powerful AI system that looks like a cute little cuddly teddy bear, but is actually going to be taking care of our kids and training them and entertaining them and you know, making sure they're safe. And, you know, we have to, in a way, understand ourselves a little bit better to be able to program them. And, you know, will there be a world consortium? And this, by the way, not just teddy bots, this is a lot of, you know, any of these robots or AI systems that are going to interact with us at a personal level, like a doc bot, um, or, or even some of the writer or creative bots. I mean, you know, how do we help them understand things we, you know, we don't entirely understand about ourselves? And, you know, in that particular story, it does go a little south. I mean, most of them do, by the way, because that's a pattern in technology. And we love it. We love it for a while, and we see some downsides. It's happening with social media right now. And then we, we, we get confused. And, you know, should we regulate it? You know, what do we do? And that's where the fear aspect comes in. And usually, in the past, we, we have figured out how to regulate it. I mean, you go back to the discovery of fire. People were probably scared of it. And, pro-fire, anti-fire, <laughs> you go all the way through technology like that. And we, we're, we're, we're going to be doing that, uh, but we've never had a moment like this where the, these machines are going to be so intimate in, into our lives and how we think about things. And we're going to have to question our own beliefs in some cases. Totally got it. And, and again, it's a fun read in that you're kind of seeing these little bots in these extreme forms. But it makes you realize that every single field, almost, maybe, I don't know, but when you think about this, is going to be impacted by this. Essentially, that's kind of the meta lesson of this thing. There's the word about, well, AI, and because you start, and all the stories start in the present, essentially, or maybe some of the people history, but it's essentially start in the present, and then you start riffing out further. But I don't think there was one of these fields that there wasn't really something realistically happening that was starting to really get traction. Is that true, basically? No, it's true. In fact, uh, well, I mean, maybe when you get in the like God bot or yeah, uh, maybe, okay. toward, towards the end. But um, yeah, I mean, that was that was part of the point of the structure of the book. And actually, they all start in the future. There's usually a little kind of almost intro. So because, again, the narrator is, is, is from the future, and he, she, or it gives you a little bit about what's going on in the future. This kind of sets it up. And then you go back to the present, which is to so this narrator is the past. And that's where you get into the nonfiction part, and you, know, you meet whoever the human collaborator is. Um, and then, you know, once you kind of, uh, I try to help you 
understand what's happening in the present with these technologies. Uh, and all of them do have a present. I mean, they're all here it's, it's to some extent, uh, or at least people thinking about them. Um, and then it moves back into uh, you know, the fictional story and the future on how it did turn out. One of the things he doesn't have, what he has is, it's never clear where we are in the timeline. I mean, we, we, where we are, I guess, is true, but the stories can go way out there. Maybe 100 years, 1,000 years sometimes. I mean, you never know. But 13 billion years. Yeah, okay, 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 okay. But I mean, but in the realistic story that you're talking about here, which you've been reporting for like two years now, roughly, um, where is your kind of five to 10 year horizon how much change do you think you're going to see in these AI technologies affecting us in that kind of decade kind of lens? Uh, do you have, any, you have a way to quantify that or discuss it? Or or you think it's still, um, maybe it's a 30 year in our eyes that we should be worried about? Because there's a lot of discussion around job disruption and all kinds of stuff. Is like, what is it all going to hit in a really obvious way? Do, do you have thought? Honestly, I do. And I think. Many of the big themes that we are afraid of right now, and people are writing a lot about. I mean, it's funny, again, there's these there's cycles. People tend to get excited, and there's all this hype, and then there's a fear, there's a hype fear cycle that happens often before the technologies even arrive. And, you know, sometimes there's different people that are hyping it, and different people that are saying, whoa, wait a minute. Um, but, you know, that's that's happening, and, you know, certainly in my field, and like, you know, health data and AI right now, there, there is a raging debate, especially physicians who strangely enough don't want to be replaced by a robot. And they never thought they would be, you know, they're highly educated types. Um, and, um, but you know, some of the issues around job replacement, I mean, it's sort of odd to talk, be talking about it when we, we have uh, you know, such low unemployment right now. But then you have to sort of dig a little deeper though. Many, many people have jobs they, they don't like and they're, you know, different than sort of jobs in the past that may have been very difficult, but you got paid a little more like you're you know, working in a factory, um, and people have to work two or three jobs, and so it gets very interesting, uh, this whole idea of automation, because the jobs are still there, which suggests they will be there for a little while. I mean, Amazon's hiring humans like crazy, but they're working <laughs> alongside robots that one day, probably in the fairly near future, will begin to replace them and already are. So, you know, it's, I think we're, we probably are, it's going to move both slow and fast, but we're not going to have radical changes in the, in the five to ten year time frame in most cases. I'm trying to think of one where there might be. Um, even well, the journalism bot, and both of us coming out of that field, I mean, there are bots writing stories all the time right now. I mean, but there'll still be a level of high sophisticated journalism that I'm assuming will be around for a while. Well, that's a, that's a good example. I mean, you all may, might be surprised. Even I was. Uh, most major publications, Wall Street Journal, um, you know, New York Times, etc., cetera, um, they do have AI systems. So first of all, they help the humans, you know, collect data, which has been a revolution, actually, across the board. I mean, the, the, the idea that sophisticated computers can now feed your information. I mean, most of us use Google and all of that, which, by the way, hasn't changed all that much since it began, which is a story unto itself. These big mm -hmm. tech companies kind of invented something 10 or 12 years ago, and they just kept it fairly static, and they buy up anybody that tries to innovate outside, of, uh, which is an interesting issue. It's slowing down, potentially, the, the innovation. Um, but, um, you know, I think we have to look probably in 25 to 50 year framework, 50 years from now, things will, there will be radical changes, I think. Um, but like, well, driverless cars is another example. About three or four years ago, it looked like driverless cars were gonna be happening like, you know, pretty much the next week. You know, they're, they're, you know, my field of media loves to hype these things, it sells, sells copies of whatever, um, e-copies e these days. But, um, you know, it, it turns out that that technology isn't really quite ready yet. And I've been down to Arizona, I've, I've ridden in these things. Um, legally, you still have to have a human in the car. And there's still some real issues around that, not only in the, in, the, in the basic technology of how it works, but you know, how do you integrate that into a city? How do you, how do you integrate that into a highway or street system? And you know, the issue of replacing human drivers is a huge issue. And I have a, you know, one of the chapters in the book is called Hell of a Robot Driver. And that 
takes place in the future where every road, every driver loses their job within a short period of time. And there's riots and you know, these, there's two or three hundred million drivers in the world, professional drivers. And I think that's one of those cases where we probably need to think that out a little bit. And in the chapter in the distant future, um, you know, basically this, this group of, of very smart people who are all women, by the way, uh, they decide, you know what, you boys, stop playing with these toys over here. We're going to come <laughs> and, you know, let us design this. And they do what they should have done all along, which I believe is really the solution to a lot of this, which is using machines to augment us and to help us and to be alongside us with things, but not, not replace us. Except, you know, I mean, it will have to happen in certain areas, but that shouldn't be the goal. The goal should be to actually um, integrate. And so, uh, anyway, that's kind of a fun chapter. But, uh, well, they all, I would say almost all of them have this kind of extreme backlash. Or, not all of them, but ex goes extreme. There's some backlash, there's some kind of moderation, there's some kind of augmentation hybrid kind of solution in the end. But not all of them happy endings, but that's kind of where you seem to be going. I mean, is there a kind of a meta thing you're trying to say here, which is let's design program these early to essentially be augmentation devices, not replacement devices? I mean, is that one way to think about it? Yeah, and that's a, a raging debate. And it's been going on for several decades, actually, since artificial intelligence as a term was coined in, in the 50s. And um, there's, there's another term, which is augmented intelligence. And we don't hear about that as much, but that, in fact, is mostly what engineers are designing now. And, you know, driverless cars, yeah, they are trying to replace drivers, but like I said, it's not going to happen anytime soon. And I don't think legally they're going to be allowed to have a car drive itself for a very long time. Um, you know, there's been like three deaths, which, by the way, is interesting because compared to the fatalities of humans driving, that's pretty good. But if you take the, you know, amount of Miles driven by each, or by humans and by robots. It's, I know the interest. I haven't done that analysis, but it'd be interesting to see. I think it's still lower. Is it lower? Yeah. Um, but again, you have a human on board. I mean, everything happens, and there's still, you know, you you uh, engineers out there probably know about the cat problem, and that happens all across the board, including yeah, with those cars. Well, computers still have a hard time identifying a cat, and this could be anything, but you just. Most systems, I mean, machine learning is changing this and, and some of the deep computing, but you have to actually show it every cat, like millions of cats, for it to identify a unknown cat. And they mostly fixed it now, but for a while there, it would, you know, you'd show it a skunk and it would say, well, it might be a cat, probably is a cat, even though it's a skunk. And then you'd show it a child, and sometimes it identified it. So driverless cars have had that problem too. There's some, there's some you know, things that doesn't, just simply doesn't identify properly. And especially when the light is off, you know, there's some environmental factors that weigh in there. So that's what I, when I say it's not happening as fast, it's still really difficult to, you know, program a computer to have that sort of broad knowledge that we, our human brains have today, at the moment we're born. And people talk about general artificial intelligence, which is what we have. I mean, we, you can be, I can be up here on stage, but I can also be, you know, the back of my mind thinking about something else. You know, if I'm playing chess, I'm like, you know, deep blue, I'm thinking about other stuff. And, you know, we have a lot going on in our brains. And, you know, it's going to be a long time before AI really is able to do that. I mean, decades, at least. Are you thinking of ideas here for questions and, and comments here shortly, because we'll get to that point. But, um, well, that is something I wanted to ask you because you've spent the last 20 years really in the life sciences, neuroscience, and genetics, and all that. Um, he's also writing a book right now with Craig Venter, um, who was the private sector side of the whole human genome project race in the early days. Um, but here you shifted to AI robotics. Um, I'm interested in just why you did that. and. Um, and also, when you look at those two kind of fields, because there's kind of an infotech hardware version, and then there's a kind of a software, you know, wetware kind of world, how do you compare the two, or how do you kind of relate the two, or how do you kind of, which, which is more interesting? Well, I basically, I cover these technological changes and, you know, how it impacts us as humans. 
So it wasn't that hard of an extrapolation to, because in some ways I think you know, biotech and biology and some of the synthetic biology is going to have a lot more profound changes more quickly than, than some of the AI. Um, say more, why is it? Yeah. Um, and maybe because I, I do know more, a little bit more about it, but AI is much more diffuse for one thing. Um, and it's also machines. I mean, you know, your computer breaks down or crashes or something that, you know, you, it really annoys you and you get upset. But you're not going to die, at least, you know, most, mostly for most of what you, we use computers for. Um, but in medicine, it's, it's really, you know, it's life and death and disease. And so these technologies, there's a vast amount of money being spent on them and a lot of it wasted. But um, I think we're on the cusp of, like say, gene editing. I mean, it's, it's taken a while. And again, it went through the hype and fear cycle. Um, it probably has another couple of hype and fear cycles to go. But you're actually editing genes in humans right now under FDA trials. And I think if those work, these things tend to move fairly quickly, um, you know, once they work, even though it's taken probably a, an extra 10 or 15 years or 20 years, probably longer um, than people thought it would. So I don't know if that answered your question, but. No, 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 but okay, so if you had to advise people in the audience here, <laughs> we're all coming from interesting fields themselves. Um, so you actually think the life science, genetics, biotech side is going to have a, a larger and a quicker impact on what's happening than essentially the AI robotics kind of impact in the timeline? It, that, it depends on what you're talking about. Um, did, but, yeah. but the life science, it's very focused. We are very focused on it because it's our health. And there's a huge amount of money being spent. I'm just about to start an article on, you know, there have been a in Alzheimer's, there's, there's been a, a massive failure for the last 10 or 12 years uh, for Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's disease. And, you know, the, the pharmaceutical industry has spent tens of billions of dollars based on a theory about plaque buildup in the brain, and that causes Alzheimer's. Now, plaque does cause a lot of the damage of Alzheimer's, but it's pretty clear now that all those drugs failed. And I want to write a story about the Wild West of Alzheimer's, and the reason I'm bringing that up in the context of your question is, there are other theories out there that might work, which have been blocked by all this attention to this one theory. But the point there is, these are, there are tens of billions of dollars sitting there ready to be spent. I don't know that many technologies out there that are that focused on, say, that one disease. Um, and we know, you know, we know enough about it now. They may all, they may all fail, but it's just, it's partly the focus on the resources being put on it. And I also have to give a caveat that biology is incredibly difficult to understand, very complicated. And in some ways, you know, building a machine, when humans build a machine, they know how it works because they built it. Um, so, you know, it, it's easier in some ways to work on these machines. But I think it's just, it's more diffuse. And, you know, I don't know where we're going to focus that kind of resources on one area, like we're doing now on like cancer or um, Alzheimer's. Okay, well folks, whether it's life sciences or AI robotics, there's a lot going on here shortly, and uh, so hang on, hang on to the right. So let's open it up to everybody. Yeah, okay, we, we've got some folks throwing their arms up here, uh, but what we want to do is, do we, we have another, do we have the, uh, the uh, is Sam? You want us to wait for the mic, right? Yeah, wait for the mic. Sam, could you run it, sir? Do we have it in the back there? I have it right here. Is it ready? Yes. Um, can we give it? She has to turn it on. All right. Uh, folks, can I see who, who has questions? I'm just trying to look at a question there. Okay, okay. All right. But let's start here. He has hand up first, please. Okay, I'm interested in two areas of concern. One, like you see in Star Trek, since everything refers to Star Trek, um, you know, you have the doctor there, which is a photonic robot, you know, uh, the hologram. And the idea is, is that they programmed all these different cultures and all to make a perfect doctor which is in a sense a, a, you know, an artificial intelligence. 
you think that, and always the debate is, can there be morality programmed into him, or ethics, or, and what do you think about the possibility of that option? And then the other thing is, is that uh, I have a friend who has MS, and I keep saying to him, why don't you get a, look into getting a, a, a some kind of artificial soup that would allow you to? Do you think that there will be a nanobox that can correct that and augment our, and in, a, in effect, the miniature intelligences that can fix and correct these problems with nerve endings destroying themselves? Yeah, I mean, on the ethics and morality question, I mean, it's interesting how Star Trek, the Doctor is always in an whichever Star Trek, you know, show you're on, it's, he or she is always, a, you know, an important element. But it's the human that's the one that's giving you all the empathy. The, the, the computer voices and even, you know, in a sick bay or any place else, I, it's always so funny how they're so robotic. Hello, yes, how would you like your tea? Not the Doctor in uh, Voyager. Yeah. Well, that's true. Okay. Yes. The Doctor of Voyager. I'm that's right. But he has to learn that. He starts out being somewhat robotic. And that's interesting because that's not really a case of machine learning, I guess, before we even had that term. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, that's, that's what, the 24th century? Um, you know, 300 years from now, who knows what we're going to have. You would hope uh, if, if the technology continues. And, I mean, look, we all want a Star Trek universe. I mean, that's, that's the utopic view. And, it's hard to find other examples in, in television and film, really. Um, but, you know, that would be wonderful. I mean, you know, I, I don't know if we'll be able to do that or not. But it is interesting that the, the people that wrote, you know, Star Trek and I uh, guess continue to write it, um, they do have a human, though, that really is, is the focal point of, of healthcare. In pretty much in all the areas. Well, you would get to that augmentation thing, you know. But I mean, it's like, you know, I can imagine there will always be a human, or could always be a human, in these kind of high-touch situations, but they'd be augmented by an insane amount of yeah. AI intelligence behind them. I, mean, I think that's right. Um, yeah. And the nano, you, I, you want to talk about the, the back there too? Yeah. nanobots for a second. Oh, sorry. I forgot yeah. um, nanotech is, is so new and, and early, um, and it's actually, most people really mean macro tech. <laughs> because nanotech is so small, you, we, you know, it'd be difficult to design anything that small that would be, you know, have the components in it to do much, at least with any kind of foreseeable current technology. Um, but where I thought you were going was more the exoskeleton. The exoskeleton. Yeah, direction. I mean, those are those are happening. That's that's a field that I would I, I need to go back and revisit that because it looked like it was really going places about ten years ago, um, and it hasn't really. Um, and I I know the military is working on it, but you know what I mean by that if you. If you saw um, uh, Avatar, you know, those big suits that those guys got in that are walking ball. Those are giant exoskeletons. But um, right now they have technologies where you can strap on these machines that basically help you walk if you can't walk. Um, they're really clunky. They barely work. Um, some people are thinking about, like the military, using them because you can jump higher, you can carry heavier loads, things like that. I know that's happening, at least in an experimental way. But so far, you know, it hasn't really gotten to the point where it would be a, a good solution for your friend, unfortunately. We have in the back there. Hi, I have two questions for you that maybe evolve from watching too much Black Mirror, but the first one... <laughs> <laughs> Finally, we went from Star Trek to Black Mirror. That's good. My first one is, what's your opinion on the Uncanny Valley issue, phenomenon, and robot, robot production? You know, you don't want someone, a robot to look too human because it freaks you out. That's the Uncanny Valley. And the second is, um, what's your opinion about scientists making robots? I remember having a conversation with a scientist involved with a lab that's putting teeth into chickens because they can, and isn't that cool? The chickens are jerks, and the, the amount of terror that emanated from me with the idea of chickens that can hurt you. <laughs> hard. So, you know, scientists do things because it's neat, and we can. So, yeah, it's like, that, that is kind of a theme in the book. It's, um, you know, again, the, the, the narrator's a bit obnoxious, and he's, he's really, he's not very happy about the notion that you just build something because you can or because it's cool. And unfortunately, you know, I, I've lived in, in California, in Northern California, the last 22 years. I just moved to Boston, but, you know, that's been my milieu, and I've got, I get into trouble sometimes. Um, I wrote a book on life extension, and all these 
people that want to live forever invited me to their meetings, and I haven't read the book. And I get there, and I go, well, maybe some issues around this. And you know, they get, they, they're they stunned that you would ever say this isn't the coolest thing ever. Um, and so that's a real thing. Although I think we're having a very interesting uh, reversal of fortune for that way of thinking right now, at least you know, with social media. I mean, really, three years ago, there was a cover of Vanity Fair with Mark Zuckerberg, and they were wondering if he was going to run for president. I mean, he was like the superhero. And we can see where, well, a year later, Wired had an issue of him looking like he'd been beat up in boxing, and he had band-aids on and bruises. Yeah. So, you know, that's kind of what happens when we overcool these things. And the, about the, the human appearance, I, I, do, I, I know a couple of people who advise Westworld. And that's a, obviously a discussion they've had. I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with that Black Mirror episode. I need to watch more of that. But Westworld is, of course, a huge issue. And, you know, because it's so dark and dystopic and how the robots are treated, um, in that universe, anyway, they decided that they couldn't look exactly human. They look really human, but not exactly, because, you know, then you, you, know, you wouldn't act the way you, you would, because it looked like another human. But it's, it's not just fiction. I remember reading about it with those little bots that help you, can I help you on any, like, your telephone quest, your telephone question, and the little bot shows up. They made it so that they have to look like not, not human, so you really realize you're not talking to a human. I think there's even legal issues, at least in, in California, not here yet, where a bot has to identify itself as a bot, so you're not fooled into thinking it's a person. But it also freaks you out if it looks like a person when the little creature talking to you looks like a person. I haven't heard that. That's fascinating. Um, you know, because I well, we we you know we deal with, with with basically AI programs and automated systems all the time, and I haven't ever had you know like you call in to any pretty much any company or airline reservations or anything. Those are you know, that's essentially AI that's answering. Um, I've never I had. don't know that yeah. unless they identify themselves. Yeah. I mean, we kind of know they're automated, but um, I've you never do. Had it. You do, but do you yeah. think average Joe Schmo knows that? That's the problem. No, no, I think it's interesting. I mean, I, I hadn't really thought of it, actually. I think it's fasc a fascinating question, but I do know a lot of robot designers have spent a lot of time on this question. And, like, a lot of the robots you will actually see is one called Pepper. And Pepper is a Japanese robot, I believe it's a Japanese company. Their technology, and it's about this high. It's intentionally made to look kind of like a child. And it's got these big eyes, and I always thought that you know, when I, when I started seeing you know these these childlike robots, that it's not going to be Hal 9000 with the red circle or the Terminator. The Terminator is going to look like this little childlike robot with big eyes, and it's not going to be scary with red glowing eyes. But that's horrifying. Yeah, yeah, but that's. I was at a company the other day that uh, it's in stealth, so I can only tell you a little bit about it. But it's it's um, they're developing small these small robots about this size, these little cute. And this is this is a great company because it's to help kids who are autistic, um, you know, interact with with humans better. And as far as I can tell, it's 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 an you know excellent idea. And you know they're working with a lot of autistic autism experts. And when this goes live in about a year, you know, we'll see how it works. But that sounds pretty interesting. But I was having discussions with the inventors and the, you know, who, by the way, come from the gaming industry and from the robotics industry. And they got tired of manipulating people through, one of these guys is a big deal game designer, you know, through games for basically just making you stay in the game and buy more stuff for the game. And we talked about how they could be designing very manipulative technology for other uses other than trying to help kids. So, but that's partly how the look of the robot is a very important part of all of that. And there's a lot of work and effort and money being spent trying to understand, you know, what kind of interface, you know, visual interface um, these robots should use. There are some questions here. Did you, oh, oh. Do we got that? Um, why don't we, you want, you got a question? Yeah. And then we'll get, so there's other folks. Hi, um, this was a great discussion. Um, I am curious, can you predict the year that we'll 
go fully into robotics, like that AI will transform us. And a second question is, um, do you think it's what? Do you think media has played a part into creating fear into people thinking that AI might be a, a problem? Um, good question. Yeah, I'll answer the first first question first. Um, and I don't really have a crystal ball to be able to do that. That's one of the reasons that I made it all up in the book. Because um, I, I don't, and, and by the way, I got tired of reading all, there's like a lot of great books out there, nonfiction books about robots and AI, but they all kind of end the same, which is we don't know. And I thought I would at least give some, you know, some stories, some, some ideas that are based on historical trajectories of technology um, in different scenarios. So it's, you know, my, in the book there, you know, like, like we said, in some cases it turns out okay, sometimes not so much. Um, but it depends on who you ask as well. Um, one of the chapters is called Matrix Spot. And it's not the Matrix in the movie, but this is Tim O'Reilly of O'Reilly Media, who's actually, I think, spoke of it, with Green and Ben in San Francisco. Yeah, in San Francisco. And, you know, Tim has also been called a work of the Silicon Valley, you know, because he's he just sort of has this great sense of knowing what's about to happen. And he's also, um, he, he's certainly not a pessimist, and he's not a dystopian, but he's a lot more realistic, I guess I put it that way, than a, a lot of the people that are in the hype cycles out in Silicon Valley. And, you know, I asked him what kind of robot he would want to meet or not meet, and his was the Matrix bot. Because he thinks we're actually, in a way, already there. That we're living inside of these different matrices, like every time you order an Uber or Airbnb, you know, you're, you're essentially putting yourself into a matrix of AI and robots that are, you know, you communicate with them, they communicate with the driver, they tell the driver where to go, you're, you know, it's all being mediated by AI. So, you know, I, I didn't think, I don't think that you were thinking about maybe like this year as being the year. But in some ways, we're there, and again, compared to even 20 years ago, 50 years ago, that would be crazy. That would be sci-fi to, to, to tell people. And you know, we don't feel like we're being controlled by AI. We're really not. I mean, Uber, these systems are all still pretty, not stupid, but they're, they're, they're not as smart as they might be, or they're certainly not as smart as they've been depicted in fictional accounts. Um, but. I think it's an ongoing thing. I don't think there's one year where it had, there may be, I mean, maybe in the future we'll look back and say, okay, that was the year. But we tend to not really know in some ways because they sneak up on us. But what was the second question? The media. Oh, the media. I mean, I, yeah, I have. You, 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 why don't you answer that? You're from the media. Well, <laughs> no, I, I, would, I would just, I would add to your thing, which is, it seems to me there's a preponderance of negativity, which is, I think, what you're saying about the future around this topic. And I'd also be interested in, why do you think that is? Like, wh why aren't we doing amazing stories about awesome stuff about uh, AI? It's almost always. Big. Well, I, I would argue that we get both. I mean, again, yeah. there's, there's the hype cycles, there's, you know, there's the scary cycles. And it's almost like there's a yo-yo that happens. I mean, in my area in genomics, in the 90s, you know, the Human Genome Project was coming to, a, to an end in the late 90s, um, everybody was talking about, I mean, it could not have been more positive. It's like, oh my God, we're about to solve this, you know, the secrets of life, you know, the code of life, and everybody's you know, gonna have a, a credit card with their genome on it in five years, and you can take it to your doctor, and they'll be able to fix everything. There'll be new drugs. And, um, and so that hype cycle, you know, the, the, the positive happens a lot, and often really premature, but then it's almost like, when, the media collectively is setting it up then to fail. Okay, I guess, I guess, I guess yeah. I, yeah, I kind of took it a different way. I was thinking that our, our visions of the future around technology, which is more like movies and books, and yeah. that thing tends to be more negative. I think you're right, I guess, when you talk about the cities, well, there's a check press. there is an up and down thing, yeah. Yeah, you were, yeah. Yeah, I'm a different. Right, right, right. Why right. Are we right. I'm, I guess I'm thinking about more the future, the future visions, I think, are almost, are very, almost always three, the big picture looks like, yeah, you know, okay. think, think about robotics, you know. Who? Is that working? Yeah, Did you hit it? 
Uh, anyhow, we should, we, we should go on another, while we're solving that, let's hear this other uh, question here. Do you want to stand up and answer that? Sure, uh, Ben Alzer with TLGG um, Consulting. So I just had a question around uh, yeah. robotics. It connects a little bit with the previous question and, and a little bit with um, sort of how we're viewing the role of AI, um, but also some of the more technical um, realization of robotics. And so my sense was that several conversations I've heard that um, our understanding initially is a little bit, you know, rob robotics are going to advance faster than our ability to program them, and that that thinking is somewhat reversed, and that almost the underlying software AI is whatever systems may be smarter than our ability to deliver biomechanical um, type robotic um, realizations in the world. So I'd just be curious kind of where you're seeing that innovation happening, um, where you're seeing gaps, um, and just your, your perspective. Could, could you run that my camera right now? Yeah. While we swap up the battery. Yeah, I think we have to you know, get technologies like microphones <laughs> yeah, right. before I dabble my brain into it. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I missed yeah. the beginning of what you said because we were fooling with the mics. But, um, I mean, basically, it was the idea that originally people thought that the software was going to be the hurdle, and now they're thinking maybe the hardware is the hurdle. Yeah. Sort of where you're seeing innovation in the hardware and where you're seeing gaps in the hardware. Um, oh, thanks. Um, I, I have to admit, I mean, I'm, I'm not a big expert on that and, you know, the, the ins and outs of it. Um, but my sense is that, um, you know, you, you have this, you know, hurry up and wait in both, in both. I mean, I, I remember when, you know, computers couldn't possibly store, you know, all of the data they needed to store and that, you know, we kind of solved that problem, at least we did. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't have a lot of insight into that. So, sorry about that. Well, why don't you grab this? No, you keep that one, and, and you use this one for the. the um, okay, we had. There's actually. Right, we'll get to you in a minute. We'll look right here behind. No, I was thinking right here. You need to yeah, switch I the mics. He needs. David needs that mic. What's that? David needs What's that mic. We need to swap those two. No, we need this mic. Otherwise. Stream, right? yeah. no, David has a mic. Like, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. You're worried. Thank you for the um, really interesting talk. I, I was interested on the um, more on, I guess, on the AI than the. Or, I mean, robotics. I also find fascinating. I, um, I've been reading um, Nick Bolstrom's book, Philosopher of Mind, on. Um, uh, it's called Superintelligence and. He talks a lot about um, the seed AIs and kind of their growth in the iterative process to make more advanced AIs. And, and they all kind of seem to have, um, they seem to go sour in a lot of ways, at least on humanity. So the thought was, at least in my mind, is, uh, you know, in terms of like guardrails for AI, um, would, like what, what would that be in your, would it be the engineer or would it be um, an adversarial? AI to kind of keep the AI within boundaries? Or? Well, that's a that's such a fascinating question. Um, you know, we, we, we sort of touched on that in different ways, but, um, you know, one idea is that the AI actually is the one that decides, like, how it's, how it's programmed and who, who does the programming. And it's learned, you know, from multiple sources how, I mean, well, you mentioned guardrails, that's a fascinating way to talk about it. Um, but this may even be partly an answer to over here. Um, the question for me really is, um, are, we, are we even thinking about this enough at the software level, you know, where the coders and the people that are actually writing about these things? Um, I mean, Nick, Nick Bostrom and uh, Max Tegmar, who I know, you know, write about this a lot, but, uh, well, Max is more of an engineer, but it's an interesting philosophical question. Um, know, who, who decides these things and who writes them. But meanwhile, the coders are off writing code. And, you know, I don't know if it's software or hardware, I mean, probably more software, but um, we, we're getting into some trouble now with social media because you have one group of people, basically, you know, white guys, and some non-white guys, but, um, you know, writing the base code for social media. And, you know, these are very smart guys, but they don't get out, get out much. And they, a lot of them, I would argue, still don't fundamentally believe that there are bad guys out in the world that are trying to take advantage of the software and to hack in. And so, 
you know, we're still trying to sort it out right now with what we have. And um, maybe we will. I mean, again, I, I was surprised myself, by the way, about being more optimistic in the book than I thought I might be. I consider myself fairly optimistic. But when you look at some of these problems, like what I was just talking about, how do we get out of the, the base code being written by people that really didn't understand how it could be abused? And we're still fighting that. But historically, we have been able to work out most of those things eventually. You know, the, the question is how powerful are all these technologies and will that learning curve you know, be steep enough uh, before real problems are caused? Yeah, that's where um, we've got a couple questions here, but I want to do one shout out to there's a Vanity Fair writer here who did one of the best pieces on this book that's floating out there right now. Um, uh, if you want to link and give people the most condensed and best kind of distillation of the piece, the book, that's it. In fact, yeah, if, you, if you have a follow-up uh, question, I'd be love to give, give you give you the mic at some point here too. But let's start with you. you, you go yeah, ahead, I'm Peter Andrews. I'm curious to um, your uh, view on AI and robotics, as far as the government is concerned with labor. Like in other words, this company has you're going to be 20 percent robotics and you're 24 uh, labor lords being robotics and AI being mm. fused with labor lords. In countries like ours, or totalitarian regimes, how are they going to fare? So, what basically could you see legal constraints on how? Yeah, going on legal constraints. constraints. Uh, I mean, uh, how how much displacement of labor at yeah, real handles you get? Oh yeah, I think we'll I think we'll see that for sure. I mean, you know, again, we're you know we have basically full employment right now, so it's it's nobody's really thinking about it. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, if if any any of Almost, almost all predictions now are pointing towards you know, automation happening faster than we can replace jobs, say in the next 30 years, and it will be interesting. I mean, the, the politics will play a huge role. And again, I'm not, you know, I, I, I think we all need to think about what role the government should play, what you know, what role we should collectively, um, you know, or how collectively we should deal with these issues. Follow up: Do you see smaller governments like uh, dictatorships being more ahead of us because they can just outline stuff? Depends on what you mean by ahead of us. He asked about dictatorships. Ahead of us. As far as I mean, they're certainly ahead of us in certain things like surveillance. Yeah. And oh, yeah, spying and robotics and AI better than yeah. us. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the question is more authoritative governments. Are they even thinking about the impact on, on um, you know, lost workers other than to keep keep them happy enough that they don't revolt? Um, and, you know, that's, that's an issue even in our society. Uh, like power break, for example, kids are learning how to code where things that rarely happen here. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is, there is. I will say one of the best books besides this book on AI and robotics um, is uh, AI Superpowers by Kai Fu Lee, uh, who uh, it, it came out last year. But he really looks at how what's going on in China, your authoritarian kind of model there just how they will surpass essentially the U.S. and Silicon Valley on, um, in the AI space for a bunch of reasons, uh, not the least of which is channeling the same amount of money into it, but also because they have no limits on, um, or very few limits on privacy and siloed information and insane amounts of data, which is really what AI needs is as much data as possible, makes it better and better and faster and faster. So anyhow, it's, it's an interesting discussion about whether the liberal democracies, human rights kind of defended countries will be able to keep up with someone that, uh, another kind of regime that would just kind of put the pedal of the metal in and go. Can we get, do we, do we have this camera? Yeah, we're going to get to them too, we're, we, but let's just keep mixing it from different sides of the, the room here. It's all so almost done, but you can see me with my hair. Uh, I'm Camilla Bergi. I have an advisory where I basically deal with innovation and cultural bridges between Africa and the rest of the world. We just wrapped the Africa 4.0 Summit in Kampala, Uganda. And we actually had Sophia, she couldn't come because of Ebola, supposedly, I didn't know was to get sick, but she teleconferenced and- Tell everybody what who Sophia is. <laughs> I don't know. A humanoid uh, robot from uh, Hanson Robotics. But uh, we basically, um, you know, we are a, a billion people. Uh, poorest people, diseased, but basically this is the first step that Africa is 
literally on the same front lines of an industrial revolution with the rest of the world. And we are learning about robotics, we are training kids in robotics. Uh, all the big tech companies, Facebook, Google, uh, all in Africa. Um, I actually wanted to pick up on a conversation that you and I had when I was you know, signing a book. You actually um, traveled from Cape Town to Cairo by bicycle, is it? which is crazy. <laughs> but, um, Young and stupid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, within yeah. the context of Africa and other people really concerned about, uh, you know, I feel as American as I am African and them versus us, what's going on in the rest of the world, like should we be scared? Um, also the, the meter, like whereas we talk about the love and the fear meter, which we have here, there, they don't really have a fear meter. They have nothing to lose. Bring it on, like love, love, love. Like you can't get any worse than this, right? So, in terms of like the context of, of Africa and this whole story, because I feel like the conversation that we are really having is really US based. How do you see this break between this robotics uh, story, between the US and the developing world, and how can we uh, merge? Um, what I've seen that's coming out of like OIR technologies in Africa, because they are completely different from ours, and not so much worried about who's listening to them, like, okay, what are like listening to them all day long. They are coming up with like really solutions um, around like solving their day-to-day -day problems. Like, can you give me some context? Mm. Well, yeah, no, it's fascinating, and you know, it goes back to my time when I was a correspondent in Africa, and I, you know, visit, I continue to visit a lot. Um, I mean, we, we can't get too, and I'm glad you brought this up, because we can't get too crazy about these advanced technologies, you know, AI, um, and, you know, we're talking about this crazy future wherever we'll go, when much of the world is still, you know, needing the most basic technologies. And uh, I, I haven't written about this recently, and I should write about it again more, but uh, there's low-tech as well as high-tech. And uh, high-tech can inform low-tech, and can be used to organize it. I mean, there's some great ways that you can use AI to organize resources more effectively. Uh, there's some weather issues, you know, the Sahel, you know, getting bigger, or the desert getting bigger in the Sahel. Um, some of these sophisticated weather programs could help a lot with that, and they should be applied better. But really, I, I wrote a bunch of stories, just, you know, 20 years ago, but um, about high-tech solutions coming in to places that needed low-tech solutions. And they ended up, you know, kind of backfiring if you didn't, um, it, nothing wrong with high-tech, and it should be distributed. Um, but, and that goes for our country too. I mean, in every country, really. I mean, a lot of people who are especially struggling a little bit, um, um, you know, with some basic aspects of life, um, you know, what we're talking about here is a pretty esoteric discussion for most of the world. Well, well, but the other thing that I would say about it, which I think is a really good discussion, because, for example, we're working out about, oh, do we want AI to be our doctors, right? And it's kind of like, well, you know, do I really want to let go of my human doctor who gives me all this attention or something? But the thing is, if you didn't have doctors, I mean, and you had an app that was super cheap, I mean, you could scale it, like, insanely, and the whatever you get there, yeah, you might not get your hand held the same way, but you got expert advice on, you know, that rash on your face because the video can, the camera can pick it up or whatever. I mean, it's, it's, it also seems incredibly powerful that these AI things, I think we kind of lose track of it a little bit because we're getting wigged out on privacy and empathy and just it can be empathetic in that. But on the other hand, it's, it's super scalable, super smart, and super cheap, essentially, compared to our crazy costly healthcare systems we've Well, well that's a case of taking AI, which is sort of driving those systems, and you know, it's not that phones are low tech, but you know, the, the basic phones that you now find all over the world, and you know, very cheaply, and you know, that is, it's an extraordinary device because you know, when I was originally in Africa, you had, you didn't have that at all. I mean, you were completely isolated, and but that's a case where you can use some of you know, the AI and health protocols, these systems that are trying to be developed, and I won't get into more detail about that, it's just, it's still a ways away from really working for a lot of interesting reasons. 
um, mostly around the complexity of, of human beings. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, telemedicine is becoming huge. And it's not always done very well. It's sometimes done by, by healthcare systems trying to save money and, you know, to kind of slough it off to these real, literally robots on sticks. And I wasn't kidding about that. Those things, they roll around. If they will stop and not run into you, so they have some sensors. But it's basically a video screen on a stick with wheels. And in some cases, that could be powerful. You know, especially if there's something visual going on with somebody, um, you know, like a rash or something that they can see, you know, because there's a doctor who's on the screen, and he or she can see, you know, through a camera what's going on. Um, and it can be incredible. It's interesting, too. There's some studies that needs to be more research done on this. Um, it suggests that people actually like that. I mean, you know, it's, it, it's not a lack of empathy, despite the little image I put up, uh, always. If, if the doctor on the screen, it's a, it's a real human, and it's talking to them. Even though it's on a screen, um, there's a kind of moment where the first time people are a little set back, like, where's the human? You know, why am I looking at this guy on the TV? But as soon as they start interacting, it's not that bad. And by the way, that's not super high tech. You know, that's putting a yeah, video yeah. screen on a stick. <laughs> so, you know, my, my point before was just that um, we tend to, in meetings like this, go crazy over all the really complex stuff out there in the future when. There are a lot of present day uh, problems that don't need that level of, of you know, complexity or money spent on them. They do need money spent on them, but not at the level of, of these crazy new technologies. All right, we're just the last, we got one, oh, we got two questions actually, and then we're gonna slip, oh wait, we're, they're popping up here, but we do have, we're gonna have, he's gonna be hanging out here, we're gonna have food and drink coming out here, but let's do a quickie here, and then I offered that one question from the back, and we got one. Hi, Ian Barber. Um, I hear you making this dichotomy between the AI, I mean the, the, the mechanical side of things and biotechnology. And, uh, the use of DNA as digital storage is the person that comes to mind. I'm sure you, many people have heard the statistic that you could take all the world's data existing today and put it on about five grams of DNA. And Microsoft actually has a, a viable experiment going using DNA as a storage medium. And to what you said before about the need for vast amounts of storage to really you know, power AI, what do you think will happen when we can take that much data and put it in such a small spot, mobile, on its own? I mean, is that where they become alive? Is that, is that uh, you know, they, they Well, it's them. not really alive just the DNA itself. It, 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 it's like it's like the software for life, or the programming for life. Um, that's that's a decent um, um, analogy. But um, well, that's I mean it's being done right now. It's a, it just it's cost really. Um, you know the, the gentleman I mentioned earlier that's in the book George uh, George Church that does the synthetic biology. He's been a leader in this field, and he took a book he wrote called Regeneration, and they actually turned it into DNA. And you know DNA is just code. It's, it's Four letters, and they actually use the double helix, you know, phosphate sugar superstructure that, that you know that you see that shape. That's what, and the DNA is, you know, nucleotides are embedded in that. And we now know that that can last. They found intact DNA, 700 million years old. So you know, in the right place, it, it, and it, 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 you need to sort of kind of a dry, um, you know, cool place. But yeah, I mean, it kind of lasts indefinitely. And the problem right now is it, it's enormously expensive because you're, it's, you're all having to build, you know, these little stretches of DNA. And DNA, you know, there's miles of it in every cell you have, but it's so it's so thin that um, it, it breaks very easily. So there's some, so some sort of structural issues there. But um, but George is also he put a movie on it. He actually put an old silent movie, a very short one, but he he converted it to DNA and then converted it back and you know, to digital and then show the film. And so, yeah, that's a kind of, it's just it's fantastically expensive and complicated, especially to bring it back. Actually, coding it is not, because they, they do that a lot. You know, they, they can build these codes of stretches of DNA. Um, but converting it back is, is the hard part. But if you could ever do that, I mean, you know, what is it, 6% of electricity in the U.S. is from storage? Yeah. Computer storage or something? Yeah. And, and with the and carbon, yeah, the carbon footprint of that, I mean, this would be pretty extraordinary to 
you know, from a lot of fronts. It's so trippy. Everything's so trippy. We're going to have the last question. I know there's other questions we can ask, but um, Mary Alice, I promised you you'd get the last word in here. So. So kind of you. Thank you for such a great talk. Um, my question is about language and teaching AI and robots. So um, there was someone earlier who asked a question about when those smart icons came to me, you know, like Microsoft Word, Clippy. Does everyone remember Clippy? That little icon that would help. And I remember, you know, the fun thing to do was to teach it dirty words, right? Like that's what everybody did with Microsoft Clippy. And then with AOL Instant Messenger, we had Smarter Child. I don't know if anyone remembers Smarter Child, but you wanted to get Smarter Child to say dirty things. And some, in some cases, people taught it to say hateful things. And we got Siri, it was like, oh, Siri, where's the best place to hide a dead body? That was the whole thing. Uh, and then you start getting ads for shovels and things like that. Um, my question <laughs> is, <laughs> my question is, we know how to teach AI dirty things, hateful things. Uh, we've seen that sort of taken to the extreme um, with some of some language on 4chan, for instance, that comes out with people um, in the alt-right movement. Maybe that's a little, off on a little tangent. But what questions should we be asking AI to teach it how to love? Hmm. That's, I mean, that's actually something I would love to hear from everybody, because yeah. I think, um, you know, I, it, it's it's an open question on you know how well how would you even program it you know as we were saying um, it's a computer right now an AI system a robot doesn't feel love it doesn't feel I mean it doesn't really have the capacity to do that like we do it's not you might be able to have it mimic love or mimic ethics and morality um, we still you know again we don't really even understand these things in ourselves entirely you know in our own ethical structure we often know what what seems ethical or not, um, you know, we often think we know anyway what, what love is or not. Um, but, you know, how are we going to program that in, into a computer as we're trying to figure it out ourselves? But these are the kind of questions that it was so much fun to write this book because I got to actually sit back and think a little bit about this and, you know, how these technologies, again, they're not quite there yet. We're not really ready to you know, tell Alexa about love. And I'm sure there's some pat answers that they programmed in if you ask her. I know, is it, is it her? I don't know. Yeah, um, which is all another question. Uh, yeah, but um, you know, I'm sure she will have a ready answer if you ask her. She's thinking, what is love? What do you think is love? But Alexa's not feeling that. There's, there's no sense of love like we would sense it. And you know, as we're winding up here, I think that's that's a, a good kind of example of what we have to keep in mind, especially as these systems become so much more human-like, and they are designing. You know, you, again, this little pepper. Pepper is the cutest thing on the planet. It's right now. It's in some hotels and restaurants. It'll actually greet you like the major day. Say, would you like a table? And you know, here's the menu. And you know, it's, it's cute. It's, it's like a little kid. Yeah, hi. And you just you love this little robot, but it's designed to be loved. And it certainly doesn't understand love. It doesn't know that you're loving. And with that, we see the food coming in with humans here. Let's give a big thank you. Thanks for doing this. Um, stay around. We got food, drink, companionship. David's here, and uh, thanks again. Sure.